Robert Phoenix here, and I'm with Heather Eland, who is a superstar over at astrolata.com. And uh, we are going to be riffing on these eclipses and Mars retrograde and a lot of the cosmic chaos and cacophony and even to some extent ecstasy that's happening right now. What do you think, Heather? How are you feeling around all this stuff? Um, it's been a weird, <laughs> sort of a weird energy with this eclipse. I do think that, you know, ultimately it's going to be a positive eclipse because we have a couple of really big grand trines forming in the skies at the exact same time, making this sort of star formation. But I think it's going to be intense for a lot of people. I mean, we have, a, you know, a eclipse, so like a new moon eclipse that's happening in the sign of Cancer in opposition to Pluto, right? And so Pluto's intensity, it's like emotional catharsis. It's a lot of stuff being dragged up uh, from beneath the surface. And so I've been seeing a lot of that in my own life and with my clients. And um, yeah, that's, that's kind of my take on it so far. <laughs> so one of the things I've noticed lately is there's a real explosion in astrology. Like people are really getting into astrology um, they're looking at it as a map for their life, a system of living. So a lot of people are coming to this kind of new. And for those people that don't understand what a grand trine is, why don't you go ahead and share a little bit of that and maybe explain what a grand trine is to people. Okay. Well, so a grand trine is a harmonious like configuration in the chart. It's three planets all in trine with each other, forming sort of like a triangle in the birth chart. And I can actually pull up um, the eclipse chart right here so that way people can kind of see what I'm talking about. And so a grand trine happens in a sign, it happens in, in a certain element, right? And so you can have a grand trine in earth, water, air, or fire. So they have to be planets that are in the same element, near the same degree, in the same, you know, in that sort of configuration. And so what we have going on for this eclipse, as part of this eclipse, is we have the sun and moon in a conjunction, obviously, in the sign of Cancer, and this is coming exact uh, tomorrow, which is Thursday. And we have it in a trine with Jupiter, which has been on and off in trine with Neptune all year. This has been a huge, like... Um, um, transit that's been going on for us this year that was activated uh, for the final time or no for the second time actually in May of this year and so it's highlighting that grand water trine that's been going on and so this is where planets in aspect work harmoni harmoniously with one another and things sort of just flow really easily and really nicely without you having to really do anything to activate it right it's just kind of like working in harmony working in flow and with Jupiter involved it's you know the great benefic so a lot of really beautiful benefits can come through the energy of this eclipse but look at this we have this opposition here to Pluto and it's exact right and so in order to get to those benefits in order to get to that sort of flow that harmony those that good fortune that can come through the eclipse I really feel like you're gonna have to be dealing with the Plutonian aspect of this which is digging up and doing the inner deep work and you know digging through the trauma digging through um, the deeper emotions and having to sort of release that having to work through it and so I think if you're doing that sort of work if you're working on yourself if you're going sort of inward during this eclipse a lot of great benefits can become um, externalized, like manifested. Yeah, absolutely. Great description of the eclipse. And I wanted to, I'm sorry, of the uh, Grand Trine. And I wanted to point out something in terms of the, uh, the geometry of the chart. Normally, this would be kind of a classic um, seesaw chart where you'd have, a, you know, one group of planets on one side and one group of planets on the other. And quite often, a, a Grand Trine will show up in what's called a splay chart. So what we have here is kind of a combination um, seesaw and a splay chart. So we're going to get some real intense energy around opposition, which you'll find in a seesaw chart. You know, there's planets over here, planets over here. There's the migration from one side of the chart to the other. It can be a bit schizophrenic. But it, the, 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 the splay action with the Grand Trine is kind of a unifying factor and a unifying theme where two disparate sides might actually be able to approach each other in a way that maybe they haven't been able to approach each other for quite a while. And does this bode well for what's going on in this country, what's going on in the world, where we seem to have a house divided? You know, we're, we're in the mythos of Gemini with the Gemini president, Sun conjunct Uranus and Gemini. Um, does this eclipse have the potential of bringing these two sides together? What do you think, Heather? Um, <laughs> I feel like that's a pretty tall order for any sort of astrological configuration right now, just given, you know, the political climate and all of that. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, there is potential for people to see the other side if they're willing to go there, right? If they're willing to seek the truth, right? That's Pluto. That's the truth that lies beneath the surface of all of the nonsense that's going on externally. And so if people are willing to like dive deep and to really do some soul searching, yeah, absolutely. I think that they can come together. Um, but it's interesting how this does highlight the opposition. Whereas normally a new moon eclipse is going to be highlighting new beginnings, right? But it's highlighting what's happening on the side of the new moon, which is the conjunction between the sun and the moon. It's not usually um, with this sort of opposition going on here. So in this case, you have to deal with the opposite, the opposition, which is Pluto in Capricorn in order to get to that new beginning, in order to get to that sort of renewal uh, energy that comes with this eclipse. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And one of the things that when, when you were talking about you know, going underneath the, the, beneath the surface and kind of dredging up, you know, whatever it is that, you know, we need to look at, you know, Pluto being the sort of the Lord of the shadow in, in astrology and the Zodiac, I'm really struck by this polarization between Capricorn and Cancer and Capricorn being sort of the, you know, the oligarchs and the states and the power, the powers that be right. And mm -hmm. um, the ruling faction and corporations and all this stuff that we've been seeing, sort of in our face since around 2009 when Pluto went into Capricorn. And whether you've been on the left or whether you've been on the right, there's been a lot of, you know, a lot of pounding, pounding away at whoever is in charge or who's ever sitting in the Oval Office or whoever's making corporate decisions. And it feels like with this eclipse, it, with the new moon right there uh, in Cancer opposing Pluto, that there's an opportunity for people I don't want to say to take their power back, but to understand that there's kind of a bigger game. There's a bigger picture, you know, that's kind of a foot. And for people to be able to, if they want change in their lives, if they want to do something that's not being represented in the uh, dominant paradigm, then to take emotional, like, authority over this thing, right? Because cancer is a cardinal sign. You know, even though it is not, say, as cardinal as, Aries and even to some extent Capricorn, it is a cardinal sign and it is, it is a sign that is engaged in initiation. So again, I think that if, if people are pissed off and they don't like what's going on and they want something new, that different, this eclipse offers the opportunity to have an emotional contract with yourself and say, I want to do something different. I want to get something done. I'm going to do it myself. Yeah, absolutely. And especially, I think that this eclipse is like the emotional connection to that. And then the second eclipse that happens, which we'll get into, of course, a little bit later, that's like actual change revolution that's in like taking plans and putting it into action, right? Mars is involved. We have Uranus involved. That's like revolution that's changed. So that's interesting that you said that. And something that um, you know, we've been having sort of the dark seedy underbelly of the corporations and the government sort of bubbling up to the surface right now. And then that's being highlight highlighted with this eclipse as well. And then, you know, America is a Cancerian country. And so um, what degree is the sun of America? Uh, so it's July 4th. So what is it? It's around, what, 16 degrees, 17 degrees right around so there? It's, you know, it's close. It's not exact, but it's going to be in a close conjunction with the sun um, mm -hmm. in the American birth chart too. So um, it's kind of an interesting configuration going on there. I, I do think that there are going to be implications for, you know, what's going on here in the United States, especially. Um, and, you know, what's interesting too, is that this eclipse, it's, I, I mentioned to you before when we were talking, um, and I kind of want to know what your opinion is on this. There's like an, another eclipse, a total or a partial lunar eclipse that's happening July 16th of 2019. And that's going to be at 24 degrees in Capricorn. And so that to me feels like, you know, a culmination point. We're having the solar eclipse now in Cancer. And then a year from now, we're having this uh, lunar eclipse in Capricorn conjunct Pluto, right, in, in opposition to this eclipse that's happening right now. So um, it really feels to me like this is the beginning stages of something. Like whatever is going on right now, like pay attention to this because, oh, my goodness, it's all going to come to a head a year from now, right? Right. Absolutely. And you'll have, we'll have to you know, bring Saturn into that conversation as well. Yeah. So we've got Saturn and Pluto and of the moon. I think it's going to be a very, very powerful time. And, you know, one of the things that's been um, kind of mind blowing is even though we're living, and again, I will say explicitly this country, because it feels like that's where a lot of the friction and a lot of the tension, and a lot of the action is taking place. Uh, even though we're living in a, in a period in time where uh, the house is divided, people are waking up politically. 
in a way that I've never seen before. And whether you're, you know, on the left in a hardcore kind of way or, you know, and you're, you just want to throw down, you know, because I would hear this is a bit of a digression, but I spent some time on a, on a progressive um, forum and a progressive um, uh, uh, ch uh, chat room not long ago. And I was watching and listening to these people talk about, you know, Hillary running again for president of the United States and um, looking at how they really don't want to have that representation. Like these are, these are died in the world Democrats and they just want to go full blown progressive, right? Which is really, you know, full, full blown socialist or full, full blown communist, right? On some level, that's kind of where they're headed. And at the same time, there's this generation, this kind of, you know, the, it, I guess it's a political awakening, but it's just this ideological kind of like volcano that's taking place. Right. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, kind of typified by this whole QAnon and, MAGA and this other world, right? There's the same kind of volcanic explosion that's occurring. But one of the things that I found in, in that chat room was that there were some people who were actually open to the idea that the left could somehow move back to the center and actually re-engage with people in America, theoretically, who have, who, have not, who have been left behind or, you know, the deplorables. It's like, you know, where Trump was actually able to, you know, uh, cash in on, on, on his base. And mm -hmm. some of those people were actually looking at that kind of a dialogue, which to me was actually, you know, kind of, kind of interesting. But this, 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 this period in, the, in, in July of next year with this eclipse and Saturn and Pluto, I don't know. I, we're we're going to go through some kind of transformation with this country. It's going to happen, yeah. right? It's going to happen. And whether we're going to, um, you know, whether it'll be some kind of a ecological transformation, you know, an earth change piece, which is very possible by the way. Yes. Uh, or, or whether it will be some kind of deeper political schism. It, it, you know, I feel like, two to three years from now, when we get out to like 2021 and 2022, I, I think we're living in a very different kind of world. That, that's my, and where it's going to go, I, I can't even begin to speculate because there's so much in play with that. Yeah. And there are a lot of people that feel that way. And, you know, even if people, so, but kind of going back to what you were saying about that chat room, there are people that are like talking about meeting in the middle, right? Like coming back into balance between the left and the right. But I mean, that's not a solution, right? <laughs> it's all the same thing. It's a giant puppet show at this point. The left and the right are the same. They're being controlled by the same corporations, the same bankers, the same people behind the scenes. And so, I mean, I think what's happening right now is that people, a lot of times, a lot of people, at least in my community and what I've been seeing a lot of like in terms of like people on Facebook and people I communicate with through my work and all of that is that people are starting to wake up to the fact that this system is dying. It's not working. We need a completely new system and it's not going to resemble the system that we're in right now because this system is inherently divisive for a reason, right? It's been sort of constructed in that way. And there's not really, I just, at this point, I just feel like it's completely broken. There's not really a good way to come out of that. Um, but so I feel like, you know, with this eclipse, with Pluto being involved in all that, maybe some people will start to see the truth. They'll start to realize what's actually going on beneath the surface. And that's sort of my hope with the yeah, that, Capricorn in general. That, that would be, I, I think you're right. I mean, I think, you know, and this gets into the Mars retrograde piece in yeah. Aquarius. <laughs> and, you know, what was it, about a week ago, there was that guy, what's his, what's his name? Straka. I think that's his last name. He's the guy that did the, the walk away, hashtag walk away. You know, you know that video? Yeah, yeah, okay. I mean, to me, that's a Mars retrograde Aquarius kind of moment meme, right? It's going backwards. Yeah, so and explain you, explain what Mars retrograde represents so people understand how that's connected. Yeah, so so uh, Mars is retrograde right now. And the retro, anytime you get into a retrograde motion with a planet, um, especially, well, particularly the inner planets like Mercury or Venus or or Mars, you know, the outer planets to, to a certain extent, although we'll see those things, um, you know, kind of culturally or, or on the world stage, but we'll still have an impact in our lives. But when those planets do go retrograde, things begin to, to some degree, disassemble themselves, right? You, you know, there's, there's forward motion, 
there's, there's some degree of evolution or some degree of process or some degree of continuity. And then there's a full stop when a planet stations and then the backwards dance begins. So with Mars, what we're looking at is intention and will and energy and direction. Um, it's a masculine force. It's not about men. It's not about women. We're talking about an energy, a masculine energy. And when it goes retrograde, you know, those energies in Aquarius, which tend to be progressive and social, at times scientific, outside the box, rebellious, radical, you put those two together and we see the backwards motion of Mars. Here's a guy, makes a video, and what is he doing? He's walking progressivism and liberalism back. He's saying, I used to be this way and now I'm not this way anymore. And to me, whether or not that was a synthetic moment or where, or was like an organic moment, it really doesn't matter because to me that typified a Mars retrograde astrological aspect. Here you have a guy who was probably, he was associated with being a Democrat and a liberal and a progressive and he changed directions. He said, you know, I'm walking away. Now, while I think that's probably not a bad thing, I think the better thing would be for us to walk away politically in general. Yeah. And <laughs> not just the left and not just the right, right? I mean, if we all walked away from the puppet show in some ways, it would be really, really good. But I think in order for that to be effective, it would really have to be a global event. It couldn't just yeah. be the United States. Well, because we already have like about half the population, more than half the population that doesn't even vote for, you know, the president of the United States. So literally, if we go by the popular vote of like every registered voter who won the presidential election, literally nobody. Right. So most right. people chose to opt out of it for whatever reason, laziness or because, you know, they see things for what they are and they realize there wasn't a good choice. So I do think there is a movement. Uh, maybe toward that, but you're right. It would have to be everyone. It would have to be everyone or else it's not going to work. Otherwise they're still going to continue on with exactly what they're doing right now. Can you, can you go back to the, the chart for the eclipse? Yeah. Put that back up there. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> so one of the things that, you know, I've experienced with the sign of cancer, even in my own charts, it's at Mars and cancer mm -hmm. at zero degrees is that cancer uh, cancerian people have um, a difficult time of letting go. Yeah, I yeah. think the water signs in general um, want to hold on to relationships, emotions, habituation patterns in ways that other signs, like like air signs, can move on really quickly. Generally, right? They flip a switch, dog gone. Water and especially cancer tends to hold on for a long time. And with that opposition, right, and this is not necessarily talking about Cancerian people, but about emotions and attitudes and having to let go of things that have been, long, that, I mean, this mood Pluto opposition is very intense. Mm -hmm. It's very, very intense. And so, we, like, are there things that you've cherished and, and kind of held on to way past your expiration date? I mean, I think this eclipse brings this up, you know, front and center. And you've got a lot of um, experience and insight around Pluto. What, what do you think of that? No, I think you're absolutely correct. That is such a good point because cancer is like deeply nostalgic. And that's actually a trait that I've noticed that cancer shares with Leo is this like deep nostalgia, this like this cherishing of the way things were of tradition or like of this sort of emotion um, or this emotional attachment to the way things were. And so that's a very good point because it, this eclipse transcends the boundaries between cancer and Leo. And those are the two most nostalgic signs by far in the entire birth chart. And then you have Pluto. Pluto wants to rip everything away. It wants to just completely leave you out in the open, naked, raw, like you have nothing, right? And so Pluto doesn't want to hold on to a bunch of baggage and a bunch of nonsense. And so there could be a lot of people going through a major emotional catharsis or a major moment of like the veil dropping and like, oh my goodness, I have to get rid of all this crap I've been holding on to for so long, right? Because it's not serving me anymore. So I, yeah, absolutely. I think that's a very good point. And Pluto, I have Pluto on my ascendant, right? <laughs> that's, why, that, that's why I tapped you for that. Yeah. I'm not one to hold on to anything for very long. Like I <laughs> 
Um, if there's something that I'm really fixated on, of course, yeah, I'm going to be really focused on that. And that's one of the aspects of Pluto too. It's obsession, right? So we're looking at dealing with obsession, addiction, compulsions. Uh, these types of issues could be coming up for people, especially people who have a lot of cardinal energy, right? Because this is happening in the cardinal signs um, and an aspect of having to let go of that, you know, and a lot of the times these are, these are coping mechanisms that have to do with emotional baggage and trauma that you're holding on to. So I, yeah, I think that that's a very good point. That's very interesting. Yeah. And where we are in terms of, again, I'm speaking about the United States mm -hmm. and kind of the, you know, some people would say evolution, maybe some people say de-evolution, but this, this, this MAGA, um, you know, concept, this brand of MAGA is, is totally cancerian, right? It's, it's about make America great again. You know, because America was great at some time, and that's in the past, and that's quite Cancerian. And and, 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 Trump, has three, <laughs> and Trump has three planets. And by the way, this eclipse, I think, is happening on his Saturn, if oh. I'm not mistaken. Or it's very, very close. I think his Saturn's at about 24, 23 or 24, oh. Cancer. His Venus is in that mix as well. And that's happening in his fifth house, which is his... Uh, actually, no, it's in the uh, 11th house, 5th house Capricorn, children. This is going to be a very interesting eclipse for uh, one Donald John Trump. That's, that's, uh, th that's, that's my prediction. And his relationship with his children and like his network, the people that he sort of confides in, right? The people that he, his social circle, which is already dwindling, you know, as it is. Um, right. That's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. So, so there was, I wanted to look at uh, historically, um, you know, what, what's happened historically on June 12th, or sorry, July 12th. Okay. And the first thing that I found kind of blew my mind. In, uh, in AD 70, right? In AD 70, 70 years after the death of Sananda, that's when the start of the collapse of the second temple began. Okay. So we're talking Solomon's temple, right? That's interesting. Yeah, so on July 12th, 70 AD. I'm like, wow, this is really fascinating, okay? That's so then I looked at um, July 12th, 2018, and I, and I did a date calculation between the two, the two dates, and it comes out to 1,948 years between the, the, the beginning of the fall of the temple and the eclipse on Thursday. Okay. What's interesting about that number, 1,948, is that if you take away the comma, it's 1948. Yeah. And that's when Israel became a nation state. Interesting. And what do we see here inside this chart? We see a Star of David. I know, right? Yeah, there is a Star of David formation going on here with the Earth trine and the water trine. That's right. And yeah. then what's also interesting is that July 12th is the birth of Caesar, Julius Caesar. <laughs> and, oh, my goodness. And Trump has been, you know, they had a big play in, in, in um, uh, what is it, uh, Central Park, where, you know, Trump, it was, it, was, it was Shakespeare, Shakespeare in the park, and Trump was, Caesar was cast as Trump in the play. And he's killed at the end of the play. You know this, right? This happened last year. Last summer, they were doing okay. this. So in that role, Trump was cast as Caesar. Mm -hmm. So here we go. We have Caesar uh, as a sort of transposition, a, myth, a, a, a mythic transposition of Trump. And then also what's really interesting is that um, if, you, if you look at Back to the Future Part Two, the character Biff is a total riff on Donald Trump. Really? Absolutely. Absolutely. Biff is Donald Trump in Back to the Future 2. And in Back to the Future 2, Biff is president of the United States. Really? And he lives in the penthouse of a hotel that he built. Oh, my goodness. That's and ridiculous. The and the world in, in, at that time is in, is in chaos, by the way. It's in total chaos. That's craziness i've never seen back to the future 2 only the first one i'm gonna to have to watch that now you have, you have to watch it so a good friend of mine on facebook eddie eddie lynn has been playing with this theme around biff and hiram a biff and hiram a biff was 
theoretically one of the guys that built the original temple. And Hiram Abiff is a very, very important figure in Freemasonry. In fact, the first rite of Freemasonry, you actually are reenacting the death of Hiram A. Biff as you come into Freemasonry. Interesting. Okay. So here we have Biff, Hiram A. Biff, we have Trump, and Trump being the builder, right? He's the builder. That's what he does. Yeah, and, wow. And if you take 1948, you add it up, you get 22. And so if we're just dealing with the number 22 and not inside of the Masonic degrees, 22 is the number of the master builder. Yeah. So Trump is the guy who is ultimately going to be a part of the third temple in Jerusalem. And this is a very interesting kind of moment in time with this Star of David and it being 1,948 years since the second temple fell. Yeah. I don't think this is coincidental. Now, I'm not sure if anything drastic is going to happen. Are they going to have a big bomb in the Al-Aqsa Mosque? I don't, you know, I don't know. I'm not predicting that. But I think that this is something that we can certainly see and look forward to in the weeks ahead, and maybe months ahead, maybe even the weeks ahead. I, know, well, I would not be surprised if we get some news over the course of the next few days and maybe even through the next eclipse I about think the next what eclipse, take yeah. place beyond the embassy. Well, because look, the next eclipse, right? So the next eclipse happens just, that's so interesting, because it happens just two days after the sun squares Uranus for the second time exact. The first time the sun squared Uranus was when the uh, United States Embassy was moved to Jerusalem. And so we have the second pass of that coming two days before the eclipse, and it's being activated and highlighted in a giant T-square formation with this eclipse, with the south node and Mars involved. Like, it's just, that's so interesting. It is interesting, and 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 I think that um, in the grand look at that 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 uh, grand cross, the Saturn cube. Almost a grand cross, yeah. The, like Jupiter's, like it's almost exact. It's a little wonky. I know Jupiter's a little wonky, and out of yeah. bounds, but yeah, it's it's pretty 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 darn close. Um, yeah. So you know, the, what's the worst case scenario? The worst case scenario is that there's some kind of event, yeah, you know, in and around the mosque uh, that precipitates the rebuilding of the mosque or, or the rebuilding of the temple or, you know, so keep your eyes on, I think that part of the world and that situation as it unfolds over the course of the next month. That, that's, and I, and what you just, what you just, you know, brought to the table here corroborates that. Yeah, absolutely. That's so interesting. And like, if you look at this, the first thing I thought of when I saw this T-square, I was like, this energy is like explosive, right? Like that is the word that came to mind. We have yes. Mars, we have Uranus in a square and an eclipse, right? And when we have eclipses, we have explosions, eruptions, volcanoes, earthquakes, right? Those yes, things, I think absolutely. Are much more prominent with this eclipse because, I mean, just look at it, right? <laughs> like there's so much Mars energy and so much like, like stuff bottling up beneath the surface that's going to explode that's what mars retrograde does if you've been keeping something in and bottling it up and holding it in as an individual human being mars retrograde will bring that out you get passive aggressive like people all over the place just like it's <laughs> it's an interesting I've, had, I've really had to watch myself and kind of cool it <laughs> you know i've really had to cool it. that i've had a few emails that i've just had to delete right interesting just, yeah i'm not i'm not going to respond in this in this fashion i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna wait i have to wait on this um but I, here's another aspect of mars retrograde that i think might be a positive one for people mm -hmm. is that if um uh, if you haven't had the courage to face something yeah. if you haven't had the ability to dig down and find um the fortitude and the energy um and the the, the moxie mars retrograde can actually be really good for that because it forces you to look at yourself and say, well, you know, where have I been hiding out? You know, where, where do I really need to apply this Mars energy and kind of, you know, resurrect some active, uh, inactive rather dormant part of your nature so that you can move forward and you can move forward with some authority and you can move forward with some, um, some direction. So, you know, if people have been, you know, pussyfooting around or, you know, not dealing with things or, you know, having a hard time with confrontation, 
Um, this Mars retrograde, well, number one, I'm going to bring it up, but number two, it'll help them get in touch with that so that you can get, dig down and find something. Yeah, and I no, I have a terribly afflicted Mars. My Mars is retrograde natally. So like in this energy, I do find personally that I'm able to take the initiative. I stand up for myself more. I know what to say and how to say it to like release that anger with it's like the opposite. I'm like, I'm going to respond to this email because I know exactly how to deal with this as opposed to blowing up and taking it over the top or just not saying anything and just holding it in until I explode inappropriately at a random point in time. Like it's, it's flowing much easier for me. And I think anyone with an afflicted Mars or with Mars in retrograde is going to be feeling that. So like what you're saying, that sort of volition, that initiative, that ability to actually stand up for yourself. It's so for some people, Mars retrograde is actually a very good thing, but for others, you know, Mars is really strong in the skies when it's in retrograde, it's closer to the earth. I mean, you might've seen yourself out in the sky right now, uh, just after moonrise or yeah, sometimes just every moonrise, it's probably not right now, just every moonrise, but like just after the, you know, the sun sets or whatever, you see this like red planet out in the sky really bright because it's super, super close to the earth. And so that martial energy is so strong right now and yes. it's so backwards and it's internalized and then it's explosive and it's just this big chaotic disruptive Mars energy, especially in the sign of Aquarius. So <laughs> that's, a, that's a great point. And it's going to be its closest right around the second eclipse. Yeah, I saw that. It's going to be at its like perigee or however you pronounce so that. One. Let's just do a checklist. We've got a Mars retrograde of <laughs> the second eclipse. Yeah. We've got Mercury retrograde. We've got kind of a wonky sort of, you know, grand, grand square, grand yeah. cross. Uh, we got Mars closer to the Earth than it's been in 30 years, yes. right? Yes. I mean, this is a, I think this is a significant time. And when I, oh, when I was back east a couple of weeks ago, we talked about this eclipse clips during this class that I was teaching and uh, one of the uh, people in the uh, in the room who's an astrologer she said when I look at this I get a sense that things aren't going to be the same after this eclipse oh yeah and I, I kind of agree with that I you know I, I'm trying my best to you know not be a doom and gloom guy um, even with my Scorpio rising but I feel like that there's some truth to that Absolutely. and there, there is something about this eclipse which is very different than some of the other eclipses we've been through, although you know that one last August was pretty pretty intense and powerful too, right? Yeah, August in 2016, and it stimulated a lot of a lot of major events in the United States, mostly weather wise, but just in general. And this one, I I, I couldn't agree with you more. I love eclipses. Eclipses for me, I was born just a couple days before an eclipse. I, they bring like all this crazy stuff, but it's like powerful change and transformation. It's usually to me very positive. This one feels a little bit. I feel nervous about it. I feel like there's something that's about to happen that's bubbling up. And most of my friends who are intuitive psychics, you know, I work on Astrolata's channel. I interact with a lot of people who can pick up on certain energies. They're all feeling the same thing, like something's coming. And it's just like, what is coming though? That's the question. What is, what is this going to bring specifically? Um, and, you know, Mercury is stationing to go retrograde the same day Uranus squares um, the sun. It's like this this one week period between July 25th to like August 1st, because then we have Mars retrograde squaring Uranus. And then we have uh, Mars actually coming into a conjunction with the South node again, actually I would say the 21st through August 1st, like that time period right there is when all the action is happening. And I think that's going to be a life changing couple of weeks. Yeah. That, that Mars conjunction with the South node, I think is, I think it's vulnerable. Right. I mean, I've, what, what I get, what I get from that, excuse me, is I, I, I get people that are really pissed off and they've had enough and they're acting out of some kind of radical volition, but, but it's not coming from um, a place of a place of wholeness in some ways. It's coming from a place of, you know, feeling wounded, feeling hurt, feeling left mm -hmm. behind feeling like you're not heard, you know, that's, that's the energy that we're looking at. And, and, and I think, you know, if we go back to that, this eclipse, which is going to happen tomorrow, if people can kind of own their own shit during this eclipse, that's coming up. Yeah. Right. And really own it and say, you know what? I was, I, I held on to this thing for too long. You know, whether it's, you know, I can't believe it's two years later, and I'm still pissed that Hillary won, or lost, rather. I'm still pissed that she lost. Maybe it's time to let go of that. 
you know, maybe it's time to be able to say, I've got to cleanse myself of this, right? Mm -hmm. if, you want, if you want to be fair, you go to the right and you find something that you got to let go of as well, right? Whatever that thing is, you've been holding on to it for so long. Maybe it has to do with the fact that, um, you know, people, you know, people treat uh, Melania and Baron Trump horribly. Well, maybe you let go of that, you know, maybe you just like, hey, it's the public arena. It's not an easy place to be. Yeah. You know, let go. I mean, the more that we can let go of, I, I think we can circumvent some of this intensity of the eclipse that's coming our way. Absolutely. On the, on the 27th. That's, that, that's, that's just an intuitive feeling I have. Yeah. I mean, that, that falls in line with the energy of that eclipse with the opposition to Pluto, but it's also, you know, the eclipse that's happening with the new, with the full moon. It's a full moon, but it's a south node eclipse, right? The south, no, the south node represents loss, endings. It represents the past. And so I feel like there's sort of an energy here where whatever people are all fired up about, it's not having to do with what's going on in this moment. It's having to do with, with what they're holding on to really dogmatically from their past experience, right? Because when we're talking about Aquarius, Aquarius, I love Aquarius people. You know, there's some, some of my best friends are Aquarians, but they can be one of the most dogmatic signs. They think that they're open-minded, but they're very dogmatic in their strange beliefs. And they'll argue it to death. And, you know, it's, this is one of those moments, I think, when that's going to come about, it's going to be in your face and people are going to have to let go of these preconceived notions that are based on something that's not it's not happening right now, right? It's, it's long past, long gone, long overdue. Maybe it is Hillary losing, right? It's a progressive yeah. sign being in Aquarius. That's right. Uh, yeah, so anyway, that's, yeah. that's <laughs> what came up for me when you were talking about that. Yeah, no, it's, I, I think, no, it's absolutely true. I mean, I, I was talking about this on my live stream on, on Sunday night. I, I mean, I got into a full-blown argument with a young woman who's an Aquarius and she's a nurse. And she was really, really cool until we got into the subject of vaccines. And once we got into vaccines, she just became, you know, Agent Smith from the Matrix. I mean, it was really a trip. You know, I was like, oh, well, you were pretty open for a minute. And all of a sudden, bang, you know, I hit that kind of ideological, you know, hot switch that Aquarians have. And every Aquarian has it, you know, and some of it could be, Whatever, whatever that ideological piece is, and for her it was it was vaccines. And mm -hmm. so I got into like, you know, kind of kind of this verbal barroom brawl with this 22 year old nurse, and and I realized that there, because it's a fixed sign, there's no way you could kind of interpenetrate that wall in that moment, right? Yeah. The only way you could get to is if you blow it up, and 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 clearly I was not invested in blowing up that that wall. I just got up and left at, at one point. But getting, getting back to this July 27th eclipse, um, I feel like, to me, what it represents is kind of like a, you know, a Sarah Sanders at the redhead moment gone too far. This is what it feels like to me. It feels like, you know, unless we can kind of sort this thing out and let go of a bunch of stuff with this eclipse that's coming tomorrow, because the eclipse tomorrow actually has some release points with that with that you know those two grand grand trines that are going on mm -hmm. and this eclipse doesn't have the same kind of release points no. but if, if if for some reason collectively we cannot have a catharsis or we can't let go of those things that we've been holding on to for life and death for a very long time this feels like like a Sarah Sanders gone too far moment or a Maxine Waters gone too far moment. Something happens. Somebody crosses a line. And when that line is crossed, I feel like, you know, there's, there's no turning back after that point, whatever that is. So, you know, if you're out there and you're a light worker or you're a Christian or whatever, and you want to make sure that we can make a safe passage, you know, throw some energy at this thing and see what you can do to, you know, be more open, be more loving, be more compassionate, be more forgiving. And uh, that's part of our responsibility too, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's good advice. And like work on your own stuff because that's really all you can do, right? Is focus on, you know, doing your work, your emotional catharsis, you know, letting go of the stuff that you need to let go of so that way you can move through it easily. And, um, you know, not get caught up because it does feel like there's something that's going to happen. And I do think it is going to cause a bit of an uproar um, on the socio-political <laughs> scene, right? Because that's like what this is. It's like, 
so there's, I feel like there's an event that's going to happen and I feel like it's going to be very, it's going to be more divisive. And so you were asking before about like the divisiveness between the left and the right and this and that. I think that whatever is going to be happening might actually cause a little bit more division because it's going to be very disruptive or it could be so disruptive that it causes us to come together. Who knows? Um, that would be the, if it was, if there is going to be something like that, I would like it to be, you know, the latter rather than the former where it brings us all together. But it's kind of hard to say, at least in my opinion, in this day and age, it's could be anything. Well, I mean, we're dealing, we're dealing with fixed signs here. Yeah. You know, and fix, fi you know, what, and, I, and I, this is one of the things that um, I was talking about a couple of weeks ago when I was in Philadelphia. And because we're dealing with fixed signs, there is, I believe, a very strong tendency for this to be, you know, kind of a snapshot or a freeze frame. Like what happens it, it is important and to, to the extent that it casts a die or casts a mold in a certain way after this point because it's not mutable, it's not cardinal, it's not setting something off, it's not the readjustment, it is actually setting the die for something potentially new, but certainly something that is kind of etched in stone in some ways. You know, so I, I think that people, like, I really, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go out there. And I'm going to say that on an individual level for everybody, right, I think you've got a few weeks to really get your emotional and psychic and spiritual life together. Mm -hmm. That that's what I really want to say, and the reason, and you always want to have that together anyway, right? And it's not like you know we have this kind of you know moment in time or this point in the distance, or all of a sudden a switch is going to flip, be flipped, and you got to be ready by that. No, you got to be ready every single moment. But it feels to me like because after this moment, what you have is what you have. Mm -hmm. That's what it feels like to me. Okay, so do your best, get clean, get clear be honest, you know, scrape that stuff out, let go of what you have to let go of. Look, there's a lot of really good energy with those two grand trines. Let's go back to those grand trines for a second. Yeah. And just explore those. Okay, so we've got water and earth here. Why don't, why don't you riff on that a little bit? Water and earth? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like forces. a mudslide, no. <laughs> mudslide could be, yeah. Um, no, I really like, so I was just talking, um, I did a video with my friends, two of my friends from Astrolata, Amy and Darren, one's an astrologer and another is a psychic. And we were talking about that aspect of water and earth and how having, um, a lot of strong water in your chart, but also having that earth to ground it out makes for people that are very highly intuitive, very psychic. And so this to me is a very psychic energy. It's a very, um, sort of, so when you have this grand trine in water here, I've been talking about how it's bringing good fortune manifestation, right? When, wherever you have Neptune in your chart it's where you can visualize something but you can manifest it when it's by itself and it's sort of like unaspected unaspected or doing something that's like weird in the chart like a square to one of your personal planets it dissolves everything it brings like disillusionment it brings all sorts of chaos it's one of the hardest transits in my opinion that can happen in, in a person's life but when you have this really beautiful trine with the great benefic jupiter that's supporting it this is you looking at the bigger picture, having these big, broad ranging goals, connecting that to your psychic energy and manifesting that in, in physical reality. And what's going to help us to do that even more so is all of this earth energy because earth is physical, right? It's taking something intangible that's emotional, that's spiritual, that's psychic, that's um, sort of ethereal, and it's turning it into something solid and grounded. And I really feel like this eclipse has the potential to transform us in that way, to initiate something that maybe we won't see it right now. Maybe we'll see it a year from now when we have that other eclipse that, you know, we're talking about that's going to be happening in July of 2019. But something is being seeded here, and it's very, very important. And I do think the end results of this eclipse is going to, I think it's going to be ultimately positive, even if there's some disruption coming along the way later this month. So yeah, that, I mean, earth and water, I think go really well together. It's that sort of, um, in um, Ayurved Ayurvedic medicine, it's the kapha element, right? It's that like watery earth where it's very grounded right. and very mushy and very intuitive and comfortable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's a good call. And I wanted to point out this interesting dynamic uh, with the two grand trines. With the water grand trine, we have, of course, the sun-moon conjunction. Yeah. The sun being the personality and the self and the moon being the emotional carrier. But those are two really, really personal elements. And what's going on is we have the potential for expansion, 
deep expansion, profound expansion, and even um, the resurrection of hope and faith in some ways, right? So if you, you, the reason why I think you and I have been so encouraging about letting things go is that there's a payoff here for that, right? There's a real payoff that people may not understand um, immediately, but clearly it's here. And so we have the individual being able to, I, I, you know, again, for lack of a better term, experience some profound spiritual expansion. I mean, it is right there, and it's water, and it's intuitive. And then with the grand earth trine, what do we have? We have relationship, and we have the other. And we have it, you know, in trine with Saturn and Uranus, which is conventional and unconventional, right? It's modern. It's what's been done for a long time. It's coming together. It's working together. It's very inclusive. That grand trine with Venus is really inclusive. So we have the self with the emotional capacitor, the emotional carrier, and then we have uh, Venus. Even though Venus is in Virgo, right? It's, it's, it's getting kind of a lift with Uranus and the trine and taking it out of its sort of normal critical phase and yet reinforcing certain ideal standards and values, but not to the point where it's completely you know, uh, rigid and fascistic. I really love this, these two grand trines that are, that are you know, working together during this eclipse. I do too. And you know what's interesting? The thing that I kind of wanted to end with at the end, kind of sandwich these in, because there's um, on August 7th, right before we have the next eclipse that's going to be on August 11th, which we'll talk about later on down the line, Uranus is going to station retrograde in its closest to exact trine with Saturn, which will be at two degrees something minutes. It's like a few minutes off from being exact. And for two entire months, because first Uranus stations in the middle of, or at the beginning of August at this degree, and then in the beginning of September, on September, Number six, Saturn stations at two degrees as well. So we have two entire months after all this chaos where Saturn and Uranus are working together. And these planets don't seem like they have a lot in common, but this brings change that's stabilizing and long lasting, right? And yeah. in the Earth signs in particular. So I think that, you know, the disruption is necessary to create the foundation to have this sort of change and to have this sort of, and I really like this energy is like after all of this chaos. So we have good energy, chaos, good energy. <laughs> Right, so we might be really looking at a really profound kind of evolutionary process mm -hmm. where you know we, we see things that are being um, highly charged and we see these forces of conflict that are kind of moving into play, you know, you know, implacable and fixed. But at the same time, you know, we're seeing this undercurrent of really strong energy that gives people a sense of hope or faith or expanding their spiritual potential, especially if they're able to let go of things and say, say goodbye to whatever it is that they've held on to for a very, very long time. It's just really no longer serving them. And you know, it's interesting about Saturn and Uranus. They, it's like they actually have a, a little bit more in common than people, you know, kind of understand in some ways. Like, you know, Aquarius used to hang out on Saturn, right? I mean, yeah. that was Aquarius' planet at one point in time until they discovered Uranus. So they shared that. And the thing about Saturn and, and Capricorn that to me is interesting is that it tends to look towards the future, which is also what your Aquarius and Uranus does in its own way. It's a bit different. Like if you're a CEO, what are you looking at? You're looking at the future. You know, where are we gonna be in Q2 or where are we gonna be in Q3, right? That's very Saturnian and Capricornian. Uranus does it too, but it does it in a different kind of way. Uranus does it like, you know, where are we going to be, you know, 100 years from now or 150 years from now? It's, but so they kind of have a sneaky way of sort of supporting one another. But Saturn also looks backwards as well because it's looking at the, the, the personal planets. And, and that's where I think it has a, a dissimilarity with Uranus, too. Yeah, but those two work good in combination, right? Using what's worked in the past to create a solid foundation and then looking forward to the future, what you can build off of that. Yeah, no, I, I think it's great. And we've been, we've been in this, um, this Saturn-Uranus piece um, but for a couple months now, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. so it's good. Yeah, I like cool. it. Well, do you want to um, just kind of give a final maybe like summary? Like if you were to describe this next lunar month from now until, you know, the first week of August in like two or three sentences, how would you describe this? Um, 
I, you know, it would be a cliche to say, be prepared to change. But I think that that's, you know, one of the themes. Uh, and, but I, I would say, you know, there's, 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 there's a bit of a feeling of melancholy in some ways, mm -hmm. like saying goodbye, like saying goodbye to an old blanket, you know, like if you were like 14 years old, you had a you know a blanket that you had as as a you, you your your baba or whatever it was right. It's like saying goodbye to your baba, because there's a bigger blanket, a nicer blanket um, that's waiting for you, right? And baba has been with you for a very long time, but it's time to let baba, you know, say goodbye to baba. That's how I feel about this eclipse energy, and um, it, so there's a bit of a melancholy about it. But at the same time, you know, you're dealing with individuation and you know to some degree sovereignty and that's a different blanket that's the that's a different cloak to be worn as an adult as a human um as a spiritual being sovereign spiritual being so i think i think that how i sum it up would be you know saying goodbye to baba absolutely i i really like that i think that's a good <laughs> analogy for the energy that makes a lot of sense yeah. um so yeah, so do you want me to sign us off since you signed us on after we had a few awkward- so Take us out of here, Heather. <laughs> all right, so thank you all so much for watching and for listening if you're listening on the podcast. And you know, if you like this uh, video, feel free to comment below, let us know what you think. And you know, maybe we'll keep doing this together. We're hopefully planning on doing it again. And um, if you wanna book a reading with Robert Phoenix, the link is gonna be in the description of the video below. I'm gonna put my link uh, in the description below as well. And we will see you guys all next month. Have a good month in a powerful eclipse season. High five. <laughs> High five. <laughs> Bye, Robert. Bye.